before we get started, I put I started off uh, the presentation with this world map for a specific reason, and uh, the reason is I wanted to ask you guys all a question, and that question is how many, uh, what percentage, roughly, in your mind, of places or countries on this map use uh, Western alphabets or writing systems versus non-Western? Any guesses? No guesses? 25%? 25 25% 25 what? English. Western. 25% Western. Western versus... Versus 75% non-Western. Population, land population. Just, huh? no, good. Everyone can hear me, right? Yeah, Just a really rough <laughs> estimate of how many places where it's official, official, that it's used, uh, whether it's used uh, Western typography or Western writing systems versus non-Western writing systems. Just North America, Australia, and Europe. Yeah, so I have 25% uh, Western versus 75% non-Western. Any other guesses? Any other different guesses? Right. Remember. So yeah. Remember, we're talking about exactly. We're talking about writing systems. It's a, just a really rough guess. We're not getting too technical. Just a really rough estimate. So we have 25, 15. Someone said 45, non-Western. Um, so we'll get back to that in a second. Um, but we'll jump right in. So keep that in mind. Huh? Keep that in mind. Yeah, so keep those numbers in mind. People said 15, 25, 45. Um, we'll get back to that in a second, but let's jump into me. Um, so Ashish gave me a little bit of an intro. I started off with a little bit of an intro. Um, I am Vivek Mahesandra. I am 27. I'm a designer and illustrator. I've only been doing it for about a year professionally, but I've been doing it on and off for quite some time now, since I was about 15, 16. I was born here in Bangalore, uh, not too far away, in Jayanagar and Gunashila Hospital. Um, but I grew up in the U.S. We moved there when I was three years old, but we've been coming back here every My family's been coming back here and back and forth for the past 20, 23 years. Um, I am obsessed with languages and scripts, and I think that has a lot to do with uh, when I was about seven or eight years old, my grandmother was insistent that I learn the Kannada alphabet right after I learned English. Um, and that kind of, I was fascinated with the differences between uh, the ABCs and the IE, all that stuff. So that kind of, I think, was what got me motivated to learn more about that. Um, I guess my first, the reason why I got into design was really because I was explaining to uh, Sandeep earlier that I uh, used to do design work for my mother, who runs a Bharatanatyam dance school in the U.S. So. So from then onwards, I, I've just been doing design work and illustration work on and off, but um, I, can, I consider myself a newbie, um, and I'm still learning, but so is everyone else. But typography has become my passion um, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, of languages and scripts and uh, what, how, they can, you know, how they can convey ideas and uh, convey the feelings in the, each language that it, uh, each, type, uh, each type represents. So, since we're talking about typography, what exactly is typography? So, typography, this is, I pulled this right off of Wikipedia. So, typography is, at the most baseline common denominator level, is the art and technique of arranging type in order to make language visible. So, the key word here, I think, is language, because language is what you're trying to convey through typography. You're trying to you're trying to bring forth how each each character, each glyph, each um, unit of uh, the, the written language interacts with one another and bring out the feeling of what it's uh, what it what the meaning is of what is what's being said. So, 
Um, so since language is the most important thing here, we want to convey language through typography. Um, it's important to keep in mind who speaks what languages, but in the context of typography, what do people write with? Like how do you, because everybody speaks a different language, but or everybody speaks in a certain way, but how do people actually write it and convey it in a non-oral non, uh, way? So this is where typography comes in um, around the world. So here's the world map again with, uh, with a big chunk of it taken out. Um, and this map, um, can anyone tell me what this map represents in the context of that first map I showed you? Correct, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty self-explanatory. So, the, so all the gray countries, all the, all the gray here is countries that use Latin script, so ABCs. Um, the, the exceptions here are the, the dark color up there, which is Cyrillic scripts, which is Russian and Ukrainian and Bulgarian and all the Eastern European languages, or Slavic rather. And the blue uh, is Greek. So these are what are considered Western scripts, so originating in Europe and uh, and eventually spread because of a variety of reasons, colonization, which is why you see Africa um, and South America and Australia and Indonesia using mostly, or using Western script. Now that big chunk um, of the map that is cut out is shown here. And these are the countries of the world that do not use Western script. These are the countries that use their own native scripts um, or scripts that have been uh, tossed around across the geography here, shown here. So the green is uh, Arabic derived scripts. So you can see North Africa, um, Iran, um, Lebanon, and the Levant region over there over the Mediterranean, as well as Afghanistan and Pakistan, which use Arabic derived script. Um, then you see India, which is uh, shown as orange and red. That's that's I think is an over, like, oversimplification of the level of diversity in scripts here. Um, but basically, India has its own in, India has its own uh, script systems, which are just simplified for the sake of this map. Then you see the big red is China, and then Korean is different. Um, so I mean, I'm, I'm assuming people ever know knows where everything is, but Korea, Japan. Um, Southeast Asia is the same color as this because all of these scripts come from India originally. Same with Java. Um, and the other, and the outliers here are really uh, Amharic, which is in Ethiopia, and Armenian and Georgian, which are not really spoken by too many people. So those are non-Western scripts. Um, this map in particular is extremely important um, because of the following reasons, and this is where I will answer the question that I posed to you guys in the beginning. These, um, this map is important because that the countries of non-Western scripts represent 50, approximately 50% 50 of the world's population. Um, that's that's uh, weighed in heavily by India and China, obviously. Um, <laughs> um, but even when you have uh, other countries like Thailand, and which are not really that high in population compared to India and China, but um, anyway, so those, so the, the, the map here represents 50% of the world's population. Uh, um, and if you look at the, in comparison to the map before, land mass wise, it's only about a third of the land mass approximately. That represents 50% of the world's uh, population. Um, and it's, these countries represent 85% of the world's major writing systems. So I mean, there's there's thousands of writing systems out there, like smaller languages in Africa and uh, um, Australia and South America, but we're focusing on the major ones here. Um, those these countries in uh, in Asia and Africa and the Middle East represent 85% of the world's writing systems. But here's the kicker, and here's the thing that makes this topic the most important of all. And this is a totally unscientific estimate, but Anyone that researches this on their own will uh, probably come to a similar conclusion, if not the same. That with 85% of the world's writing systems, these languages in total contribute only about 10% of the world's total typefaces. Um, so clearly there's a huge deficit in the number of typefaces that are available for these languages or have been developed for these languages versus the 
the percentage of the world that these languages occupy, or the percentage of the world that these writing systems occupy. Um, so the other, the other important things here that make this particular region of the world most important in terms of typography is that these, these countries represent huge emerging markets, which again is weighed in heavily by India and China, but certainly also by the countries of Southeast Asia and developed economies like Japan, um, as well as uh, some of the development that's happening in the Middle East. But really, it's India and China that are really the, the anchor weights of countries that are representing 85% of the world's writing systems. It's kind of a, a mumble jumble of words there, but I hope you get the point. Um, since they're huge emerging markets, that means there's going to be increasing influence. That means these countries are going to be having a bigger say in the world's affairs, as they already are. Obviously, China and India are. Um, and that means that there's going to be differences and uh, improvements and changes in social and economic development. And as soon as increasing influence in social and economic development and changes and uh, economic booms and all this stuff happens, there's going to be, there's always an increase in need for all types of different services. One of them being design and within design typography, which is, the, which is such a core concept, such a core aspect of language and how language is disseminated throughout these places. What does all this mean? This, this means that we're just getting started in these parts of, in this part of the world. Um, these countries, like I said, they only, they only represent less than 10% or less of the world's typefaces. So typography, in the context of typography, we've barely scratched the surface of what's possible and what kind of creativity we can dive into and what types of applicable uh, typefaces we can design or how we can apply typography for society and um, a variety of other different things. And that's why this call, this talk is called Type of the Rest of the World. Um, and that's a picture that I took in Dubai, actually. I was trying to represent the, the increase in development and these sorts of things. So, um, What we'll do, basically, for the talk is I'll go through um, three mini case studies of three very um, typographically influential scripts that are non-Western. So the whole point of this talk is to dive into non-Western scripts. So we'll do three of them, and then we'll do a little bit on uh, Indian typography as well. So the first one we'll dive into is Arabic. Um, and like I said earlier, Arabic includes, for, in the context of typography, Arabic includes Persian, Urdu. Um, it also includes a bunch of other languages, that, uh, like Sindhi, for instance, and Pashto, and Jawi, which is used in Malaysia. For, uh, for official types of things. But Arabic is an interesting script because I think it's probably one of the most different that you can get from Western type, from the ABCs, just in terms of how it's structured and how it operates. Um, so, it, I mean, it's got a very long, illustrious history. Um, it's religiously very important because of the Quran, which is uh, read by 1.2 billion Muslims. Um, so here, the next slide showcases um, a quick, uh, just a quick snapshot of a font called Wadi, which is developed by um, Dina Merhej, who is a designer from the UK. Um, this font particularly characterizes some very key elements in Arabic. Um, no, well, one very key element in Arabic, which is the, the tips of each letter. So each letter has different tips based on where it is in the alphabet. That's just to kind of get, get us started. But the characteristics really of Arabic are, it's a right to left language. Um, so you read it from right to left. The letters flow together. So it's so if you're writing cursive in English, it's Arabic is by default cursive. It's always cursive. So every, um, you know, every time you have, every time you look at an interaction with one letter with another, it's, it has to physically join. Uh, unlike English, where as you can see, obviously the letters don't necessarily not necessarily join unless you're writing in cursive. And this, this is really key here. So each, each Arabic letter um, has three positions, depending on where it is positioned in a word. So what's an Arabic word? Um, like the word Quran, for instance. The Q, the P in the beginning, is, looks different in the beginning of that word. If, if 
for example, if that word was bukaran, then the ka in the middle of the word would look different. Um, I should actually have some examples of that coming up. But, um, but the, the letters look different based on where it is. So each time you design a letter, you have to design it three times because of the beginning and the middle and the end. So it's going to beginning, it's the initial, medial, and final positions of each letter. Um, so this is a uh, exploration of Arabic type by a Jordanian designer, a uh, Jordanian visual artist named Ahmed, Ahmed Sabah. And it kind of gives us a feel for how the language operates. And this is kind of more of a ornamental, kind of fun way of looking at it. Um, you can see the language has a very horizontal focus. Um, so, I mean, English for Western scripts, you can see are kind of tall, the A's and the B's and the, you know, things are vertically aligned, even though it reads horizontally. But Arabic script is very horizontally based. This one, you can see each letter kind of, and because of the horizontal, uh, alignment of Arabic, when you have that focus, you can uh, manipulate the letters to match kind of a grid as this guy has done here. Um, this is a uh, picture that I took of some graffiti that I saw in Berlin, Germany. So this is interesting because, uh, well, not only because of the political statements that I think it's making, because of the this happened right after the Arab Spring and all that stuff in Egypt. So Tahrir Square, if you guys don't know, is where the where the whole Arab Spring revolution it was a is a symbolic place for the entire revolution in Egypt. Um, this is stencil art, so someone spray painted it through with stencils. But the interesting thing here is that the English the English writing here is written in Helvetica, which um, you know if you know anything about typography, Helvetica is kind of like the most um, ubiquitous font that you see all over the place. Uh, so I just look around here. I see Helvetica on this uh, computer right now. I see Microsoft logo is Helvetica. Microsoft, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Microsoft's logo is in Helvetica. There you go. Um, many logos are in Helvetica. I think last time she did, did a Helvetica versus Arial quiz for everyone. Um, but the interesting thing here is that the Arabic is also in Helvetica because um, it was, there was a Helvetica that was developed for Arabic, which matches this, uh, which matches the English Helvetica. So it kind of takes the same characteristics of Helvetica and applies it to Arabic, which is very clean lines, very elimination of BS, if you will. Um, and uh, and you, can see, you can see kind of how the Arabic script matches the English script for this particular, um, this particular example. But um, the point here is that Arabic has been an interesting case because there's been a lot of Western scripts, Western typefaces, which have been adapted for Arabic. So Helvetica is not the only one. There's been Universe, uh, Palatino, uh, and Frutiger as well. Um, Frutiger is a really important one. That was designed in, I believe, the 60s or 70s when Paris Airport was um, looking for new signage. So they commissioned an entirely new font just for that. And they, that's been translated into, into Arabic. I believe some airports in the Middle East right now use Frutiger as well. But this um, is Helvetica in both languages. This one is an interesting uh, example. It's, this is basically a uh, tourist guide for uh, Arabs who are visiting the Netherlands. And it's entirely in Arabic. And it's called Shemal Nord. And it's, it was developed by a collaboration between uh, Dutch and Arabic uh, designers uh, from Egypt and elsewhere in the Middle East. Um, and it was developed on the Fedra Sands model. So Fedra Sands is another very important uh, Latin or Western typeface. So that's been adapted into Arabic for this. And it, there was a typographic match -make, matchmaking project that was done uh, between 10 Dutch and 10, um, or 10 Dutch and Arab designers to develop this sort of thing. So it's, I mean, this, this is just an example of how uh, similar typography in different cultures can bridge the gap and get people to, uh, for example, in this case, get Arabs to know more about, it exposes Arabs to uh, different aspects of the Netherlands by adapting Dutch typeface to the language of the people who are going to be reading this, in this case, Arabic. Um, this one is another one just from Dubai, um, another example of just how Arabic is, has been adapted towards Western typefaces. Uh, this is just falafel, which I think it is opening in India soon. Um, but it's a uh, it's a it's a falafel joint basically. They're they're a chain across the Middle East, and they have some other branches as well. But basically, this is in 
Dubai where you can see how the, 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 the Arabic type has been adjusted to fit the English type. Um, and the reason why, and, it, and you might be noticing a trend that the Arab, Arabic type usually adjusts to fit the Western type. That's just because Western type has been around for much longer and there's far more examples that you can adjust the Arabic type to um, for Western type. Um, this I thought was interesting. This is a, uh, this is, these are obviously major brands, Western brands, uh, that have been given Arabic Arabization, if you will, um, of their logos and the, the typefaces of their logos. So you can see how, like for example, in diesel, it's very tall, but they've adjusted the Arabic type so that it, that is also tall. Um, and the other, and yeah, I mean, you can see this one, for example, there's serifs that they've added on. Serifs meaning the little tips at the end of each letter have been added on to the letters in Arabic, which Arabic letters don't naturally have that at all. And Paul Smith at the bottom has been, it's a cursive thing, so this one is probably the easiest one to do, just because Arabic is naturally cursive. So that's just a little bit about Arabic. Um, we could go on for hours, but this is just a quick overview. Um, the next one we'll go on to is Chinese. And Chinese is particularly interesting because of a variety of reasons, and just like Arabic, it's extremely, extremely different from uh, both Western type, but in, in terms of the language itself, it's completely different than any other language out there, just because of the way that it's structured. Um, so some characteristics of Chinese are that it's, you can read it right to left, left to right, or top, and top to bottom. So you can read it any which way you want, and the reason for that is because it uses characters, so there's no letters in Chinese. You can't read something out by, you know, sounding out the what each letter sounds like. You just have to memorize the letters, or the characters, rather. Um, that's what enables it the flexibility of being able to read in which direction, whatever direction you want, basically. Um, if you, if, has anyone here been to China? Okay, so you probably, if you've been to any of the, like, the historic sites there, you'll notice that, uh, and if you were noticing the language, you'll notice that the, um, the, the writing on uh, the old, uh, the old palaces and old uh, famous buildings are written from right to left. So traditional royal things are written from right to left. Nowadays, mostly it's left to right just because of, um, just to make it easier for everyone because people are learning English as well. But top to bottom is something that you'll see a lot in newspapers. Um, so that's, that's very interesting for Chinese. And in terms of characters, there's 5,000 characters that you have to know if you want to read like a basic newspaper that you just have to memorize. And these can be extremely complicated, so it's a huge, it's a huge task. I studied Chinese for three years, and uh, it wasn't easy. <laughs> um, but, but in reality, there's well over 25,000 characters in Chinese. So when you're designing type for Chinese, you're going to really just aim for the first 5,000, because most of the remaining 20,000 are uh, either obsolete or used in very kind of artistic cases. Um, or, poet, or poems or things like that. Um, the other interesting thing about Chinese is even though it's very complicated, it's also very simple in a weird way. Like all Chinese characters are, use the same set of strokes. So there's a set of like nine, I forget exactly how many there are, but there's a set of nine strokes we'll say. Every single character in Chinese is a combination of some kind of those nine strokes. So in that, in that sense, it makes designing Chinese type very easy. All you have to do is design these nine, nine things and you're all set. Um, so we'll dive into a couple of the examples of Chinese here. So this is a picture I took in Hong Kong at the Sun Yat-sen Museum. Um, you'll see Optima, San, Optima Sans as the typeface on the bottom for English, uh, which kind of conveys a, you know important regal feel without the use of serif. Uh, but in Chinese, however, you don't see the Chinese type being uh, adjusted towards the Western type. You see the Chinese type using traditional Chinese uh, characters. Um, and, oh, and the other thing that I forgot to mention is that there are simplified and traditional characters in Chinese. So simplified characters were ones that Chinese government implemented in the 50s or 60s to improve literacy across China. Um, but in Hong Kong and Taiwan, and by overseas Chinese communities, they use the simplified or the traditional, sorry. And these are traditional characters. So these kind of have a cal uh, calligraphic uh, tone to them. 
It should also be noted um, that Chinese, I think the Chinese were probably the first real typographers because they, um, they Im invented woodblock printing on cloths back in like the second century BC, um, well, far, far before the West even developed such things. Um, it's funny that you don't hear about these things because, you know, 90% of the world's typefaces are Western, so you only really get to focus on those. But this is one example. Um, I had to get a SIM card when I was in Hong Kong, and uh, this is an example of how Helvetica, you can see the English is in Helvetica, um, and the numbers are obviously in Helvetica, but this is how, just an example of how the Chinese text has been uh, aligned to fit the to the English here, um, and it's and the other interesting thing about Chinese is since since there since it's based on characters and not letters, each character has one block space, so every single character takes up the same amount of space. Um, so it, if you notice in Western type, uh, or in type of most other languages, actually each letter will take up a different amount of space. And w obviously takes up more space than a, than an I. And in Chinese, they are all the same size, regardless of how complicated or how simple they. Are. They are. Um, this next example, this is an interesting experiment by a Tao Chen, who's a designer in China, uh, who did a Gothic Chinese typeface. So Gothic, so this this style of lettering you might see in in, in, uh, in Western type on like the titles of newspapers and that sort of thing. Um, it's it's originally it was called black letter. So he, this guy wanted to, this designer wanted to uh, translate that over to the Chinese context. Um, it's just I just thought this was an interesting example of how you bridge different cultural roots because black letter was among the first uh, Western style typefaces ever. So bridging that with Chinese, which has a far longer um, type tradition, um, is an interesting exercise. I thought so. I thought I'd uh, throw that in there. And also you can see that there's ABCs at the bottom too. Um, and those set of characters are just just um, let's see. I believe it's just a description, it's not really saying anything, but the first, I think is Gao Ti Ke, yeah. So the first, uh, the first, or the, the, the first three characters up here spell out Gothic. Um, this image was taken in Singapore, um, in Chinatown, which is I think the only area of the city where you'll see street signs entirely, in, in, or street, uh, street signs in Chinese as well. Um, I don't know, do you know the name of the, the Western font here? It's pretty, it's a pretty common one, actually. It's not the HP Hmm? Well, anyway, I just thought that it was, this, this, you see this quite a few places, actually, this, this Western font. I, I, at least I have. I think it's on, it's on signage, typeface, but... Um, but the interesting thing here is that that's um, effectively, if you want to break it down, that's a sans serif. So there's no um, there's no little tips at the end of the letters. But in Chinese, at the bottom, it's a serif font, which means that there's little you see these little tips here, and uh, this this really if there if this was a sans serif, it would just be a straight line. But there's little tips here, and and it serves the same purpose as it does in, uh, in Western typefaces, which is to increase legibility. And given that this is a street sign, I think that makes sense. Um, a similar example is, this is in the Hong Kong MTR, the, the, effectively the Hong Kong Metro, uh, where they use Myriad Pro, which is the same font that Apple uses for, uh, for the English, or for the, for the Western script, but they use a serif Chinese font for the uh, for the Chinese names of the places, and I think that might have to do with the since Hong Kong uses traditional characters, there's far more strokes and far more complications in each of the letters or each of the characters. So, um, using a serif in this context will probably make it easier for people to read each each character. Um, so, is each stroke a sound? No. Okay. So no. So each so each character is represents one syllable. Yeah. So, for example, here it's Yao Ma Te. That's Yao. That's Ma. That's Te. Okay. But something like Prince Edward, how would they? Well, what about Jonah? 
So they have different names. They'll have they have their own names for. Uh, I don't know what this, I don't know what the Jordan one is, but. Maybe yeah. Okay. Maybe yeah. Um, no, that's like that's like an actual thing. That's probably what it is. But. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people also who are called Jordan in the U.S. call themselves Jordan. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Prince Edward is tied to. So. Yeah, there's a direct translation for like Starbucks coffee, for instance, in China is Xing Ba Ke, which means Xing means star, and Ba Ke is just the translation transliteration of, of bucks. So, so Chinese is interesting. Chinese is very interesting in that way. So I mean, like here, like East Sim Sha Tsui, for instance. I mean, it's only two characters. That's because Sim Sha Tsui here is that Sim that's Sha that's Tsui, but. Uh, when there's long words like that, they'll just shorten it down to one character, which represents the whole thing. So, the sim, sim tong is what that says. Sim, uh, this was in Cantonese, so it's a little bit different how they pronounce it, but the writing is the same. So, is it that they have a single word or a single word, every other word in Chinese? I mean, they were, they were originally idiomatic, right? So, they basically drew everything as a little picture. So, there yeah. was a picture for a bird, and there was a picture for a house, and a picture for a river, and then you put two pictures together and they made a more complex word. Now it's just become letters that people recognize, and mostly it's the sound, which kind of sounds like the original word which it represented yeah. many, many years ago. Like when I was in Chinese class, I was I was asked to cho choose a Chinese name, and I could choose several of them because of just how mm -hmm. how I wanted them to sound, com and as as well as what I wanted the characters to represent. So Chinese is Chinese is interesting because there's there's just a ton of there's a ton. I mean, there's five thousand, twenty five thousand characters, but the number of sounds is very limited. Uh, I forget exactly. I don't know. You might know this, Pujo, but there's a very sh there's a very small number of there's just a bunch of repetitive sounds because it's a tonal language. Um, so there's four tones. Sorry. Yeah. Well, yeah. It can be very hard to speak. Like for the word for India in Chinese, Hindu, and you have to say it like that, or else it'll have a different meaning. So, and like Bangalore is Banjia Luo or something. Or, or, Luo. I believe it's something like that. So it's. Um, and the characters will have an associated meaning as well. So, and then and there's some characters which are meant for usage in foreign words. Um, so, like the word for Delhi is Delhi, and both of both of those um, characters for Delhi are you'd only see. I mean, you'd see that in other uh, words that have a de in English. So you'll say the. Like I'm trying to think of um, another example. I can't think. Of Denver. Yeah, maybe. Uh, no, it would be for Denver. There, there would be a, a, a there would be a syllable that's associated with it. So it'd be like a den. So like den would probably be the associated word. And then there's some words which are just totally different. Like San Francisco is Jiuqin Shan, which means old gold mountain because that represents when the Chinese immigrated to the U.S. back in for the gold rush back in the 1800s. So. Yeah. Uh, how, how the characters don't. You just have to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally. So, which is why it's it's just extremely difficult. <laughs> it can be very difficult, but like learning the language itself is actually I found it kind of easy because there's no verb conjugations. There's no. Um, it's it's very very simple. So if you say you don't you don't have to say I will be going to Microsoft. You can just say. I go to Microsoft, or I will go to Microsoft, and that's and there's no to, so it's just like I go Microsoft. So it's like it's very simple in that sense. So, so it was basically like I made this thing, and this means this, so we have to follow it. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. Someone needed it, we followed Yeah. So yeah, Chinese. I mean, you can go on for hours talking about Chinese because it's probably one of the most interesting and complicated and complex systems out there, both linguistically and uh, written-wise. And then the other interesting thing about Chinese is that the writing um, takes the writing. There's a very very heavy emphasis on the writing. So there's very heavy emphasis on the type. There's very heavy emphasis on the calligraphy, um, which is 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 far exceeds the emphasis on the speaking. Just because there's so many, there's so many characters, and there's so many meanings that you can pull out of each character, and uh, well, that's not true. There's so many meanings that you can make with a. Con
combination of many characters, even though speaking they might all sound the same. So we can go on with this for a long time. <laughs> but um, so that was just kind of a quick overview, just a super quick overview of Chinese. I totally didn't do it justice because just judging by the questions that people are asking. But the next uh, thing I wanted to jump into was Thai, which I think is particularly interesting because of a, here in India, it's, it comes from the Brahmi script, so it's, it's essentially an Indic script, um, so it's closely related to the Indian uh, writing systems, um, and it's uh, extremely translatable. When you're trying to bridge Western typography with Thai typography, or with the foreign, with the non-Western type, few languages come as close to Thai in making it look very similar. Now you'll see some examples uh, going forward. So some of the characteristics of the language are it's left to right, so it's read just like English or any of the Indian languages. Um, it's a phonetic abugida, which basically means, I mean most of the Indian languages are abugida, so that's, there's the consonant and you associate the consonant with the vowel and you create a letter. So there's like for the, for in, for in you know, Hindi, or pretty much all the Indian languages, the ka, there's ka, there's ki, there's ke, there's ku, so it's like that, so it's, Thai has that as well. Um, the writing of Thai contains a lot of loops and holes, uh, kind of like Tamil, for instance. Um, it's, it's different, you'll see it's different. Um, and many have, has any, who's been to Thailand here? I'm sure someone's been to Thailand. Yeah, a few people have been to Thailand. So you'll notice that the writing system is, looks very, very Indian, and for the untrained eye, it looks, you know, just might as well be another Indian script. Um, and there's lots of marks, so unlike Chinese, which doesn't give you any marks for tones, Thai does. So there's tons of different marks that you can use uh, for different sounds and different, uh, you know, intonations and uh, inflections that you can make with each letter. Um, so, this, uh, this example is a Thai serif. So as you can see, it looks super similar to English, right? Like, I mean, there's, this looks like an S right here. That's a backwards G. I mean, it's, they've really, it looks like they've just taken English and screwed it up a little bit and made it, <laughs> made it their own, which is effectively what they've done, except they've really utilized, the, utilized what's already worked in English or with uh, Western script and applied it to the, um, to the, compli to, I guess, to the complexities that Thai might have. Is it uh, also the case with Russian uh, scripts? Yeah, yeah, Russian is similar. Yeah. Um, up with English. <laughs> well, the script, the the, well, the Russian scripts kind of developed off of a European root anyway. So, but this this didn't, which is what's what's interesting about this. This developed off of an Indian Indic, not Indian per se, but Indic uh, root. So, um, for example, the S that you see here is a ra, it's an R. Um, uh, let's see, there's some other ones. This is just an A right here, and it's and it's it's and the way that they've um, the the way that they have kind of manipulated the alphabet to to match up with a Western ideal for a serif is interesting. Um, I guess in Western context, this would be considered a modern serif because there's there's a um, there's a lot of uh, contrast between how thin the serifs are and how thick the the, 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 the just trunks of the letters are. Um, also, this one was commissioned, you'll, see, you'll find this a lot in typography, that fonts are commissioned or typefaces are commissioned based on need for a specific type of project. So this one was for, um, if my research was correct, it was for L'Officiel magazine, um, for the Thai version, and the typeface is L'Officiel TH. This is um, this type is this typeface is called Krung, Krung Sri Simple, and again it takes cues from Western sans serifs. Um, so I mean you see the same type of thing, the, the ra, which is just becomes an s. Um, the this is a la, but it looks like an a, like a lowercase a almost in English. Um, so you see the, so you see the, the the way that they have kind of manipulated the language to fit a to fit a um, to fit a concept that has already worked in Western type, um, which which is I think what makes Thai so interesting because you, it's, that they've been able to do this with such success and that it actually sometimes if you look from afar it might look like English in a way but you know that something's off. <laughs> um, this one is called IKEA script Thai and 
if anyone's been to IKEA, um, you'll see like the sale signs and everything will be written in this type of a, of course, Western writing. Um, but this one in uh, was done for Thai, so this was another, thing, uh, another example of the flexibility of Thai uh, alphabet. Uh, this is just another example of that as well. You can see how easily the the letters in Thai. Uh, match up with the, the way the letters in English uh, interact with one another. Um, this, uh, this, this project I thought was super interesting, and you might know about this, because this was in, uh, this was, this project is, uh, was for the development of the Lumen um, typeface. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's what I figured. I, I knew you went to Reading, so. Um, so Ben Mitchell is the guy that created this, and basically it was a it was a typeface to integrate um, Burmese, which you see on the left, uh, Thai, and Latin, and the, you know Western writing system as well. So <coughs> the whole idea was to to have a, um, and you might know more about this than I do, but um, to integrate I guess the personalities of each each um, each typeface or each language into into one, so that um, each, whether it's an A in English, whether it's a, a Ya in Thai or a similar character or a similar letter in Burmese, it brings out the same kind of, uh, it conveys the same meaning, if you will. They use the English one system. Where? <laughs> yeah, sometimes. I mean, you see that here too, because the Thai has its own numbering system, and a lot of times they use that too. Like, same thing, similar, like, similarly here in India, because we have our own numbering systems, systems as well. Um, but you'll often see the, the Western numbers, or the Arabic numbers, I don't know what the exact term for it, but um, Hindu-Arabic Hindu -Arabic, uh, numbering system, which is ironic, I guess. Um, <laughs> um, so this one is a, uh, this, this is just a road sign in, in Bangkok, and this is just an example to show how uh, they've, in Thailand, the road signs have been standardized, so they've used a, so they've, they've used this, this is the, I mean, you've, you, I'm sure if you've been to uh, Australia or the U.S. or Canada, um, this is the typeface that you see on all the road signs. Um, so they've integrated that with uh, a corresponding Thai uh, typeface, and this is an example of how that sort of thing can be standardized and um, applied across, across the country. This is another example of melding two uh, languages types together. So this one is Helvetica. You saw earlier there is a Helvetica for Arabic that was developed. There's also a Thai Helvetica. Um, and I'm willing to wager that they were able to do a Thai Helvetica because uh, of how translatable and how flexible the Thai alphabet can be with the shapes and the, uh, the way that Helvetica already operates in a Western uh, Western context. Like this looks like a backwards C, but it's a wa in Thai. Um, the next we'll move into perhaps the most interesting uh, interesting uh, part of the presentation, and that's Indian Thai. Um, and the interesting thing about India is that it, I, I believe out of, there's about 24, there's about 25, the 85 percent, when I was talking about 85 percent of uh, the, the typefaces in the world that are non-Western, uh, or the 85 percent of the population, sorry. Um, a large major, a large percentage of those are actually Indians, because the Indian, Indian uh, writing system. So you'll see there's, I mean, there's, there's Arabic, um, and then there's, uh, all the Indian writing systems, and then there's Thai, Burmese, Lao, Khmer, Chinese, Korean, and Japanese. And that's about it for major in-use today writing systems. The rest of them are Indian, so who can name all of these? I think I heard all the names there. Um, uh, no one's in Aria, that's what I was about to bring up. Okay, she did in Aria, okay. Um, yeah, so there's nine, there's nine major in use today official Indian scripts that you see um, that are official. So 
so there's obviously Devnagari, which you use for Hindi and uh, Marathi, and I, was, I think Konkani uses it as well, uh, which by far is the lion's share of Indian type or Indian script in the country. Uh, below that is Kannada. Um, that, I just took that right off and that's very close to my house. I thought it was a cute saying, which just says, who can, who can read Kannada here? Just a few, okay. Hasire Usiru. Huh? Green is like green. Hasire means green is, green alone is breath or breathing or something like that. So, um, below that is Tamil, which I just, I just took that picture in Chennai last week. Um, then there's Bengali, which I have not been able to master yet because it's super complicated. Um, above that, uh, this is Gujarati, and this is Malayalam, Gurmukhi, which is essentially Punjabi. Telugu and Oriya. And Oriya is, someone, uh, Oriya is one of them which people tend to overlook quite a bit just because of the, uh, I guess, small population. I think there's only about 33 million native Oriya speakers compared to far more, far higher numbers of each of these. Um, or far higher influence in the country. So clearly we're looking at a very diverse, we are the most diverse um, country, obviously, in a variety of ways, but also in uh, in type and the number of scripts that we have. Interestingly enough, all of these uh, all of these writing systems come from the Brahmi, which was used in Emperor Ashoka's time. Um, so Devanagari, and you'll see obviously parallels between Devanagari and Bengali and um, Gurmukhi, as well as Gujarati. Gujarati almost looks like Devanagari without the line on top. Um, and then Kannada and Telugu look very similar. Uh, and, Mal and Malayalam and Tamil kind of look similar as well. Oriya is the only one that really stands out as being really different. But even that is, if you kind of dig deep, you'll see the similarities with the other languages. So the state of typography in India today is one which makes me very happy and also kind of sad. Um, I think there is a lack of options. Just given the size of India and given the scope of things that are happening in the country, there is a lack of official options. Um, official meaning typefaces that have been developed and, uh, and created by typographers. Um, it's informal a lot of times, and that's, that's very obvious. When you go outside, you can see guys painting on the side of the road. Um, that would, I guess, be considered in, informal typography. Um, and a lot of times, informal typography is kind of the essence of India because these guys have no real training. They're just, there's, and some, and some might, but they really are just, uh, they're just being creative with what they know and what they can, what they need to type out for this particular, or what they need to paint out for a particular task. Um, it's impractical, and I think it's, and a lot of that, and a lot, and a lot of times it's the informal type that's the impractical type because it's very flashy and very colorful and very exciting and very cool looking, but um, it's not really practical for day-to-day -day use most of the time in terms of informal type. And the other thing that I think um, is a reason for why there may be a lack of options is because English is already everywhere. So, and a lot of people can already read English. So, what is the incentive, or what is the, where is the need for uh, developing types for typefaces or fonts for each of the nine major Indian scripts. So these are just a couple of quick examples. This one is in Chennai. Um, the top is Tamil, obviously the middle is English, and the bottom is Urdu. Um, and and you'll see. I mean, you see the creativity. You'll see this particular uh, type of uh, designs on the type a lot of a lot of places where where these these bevel um, outwards, and it's just a paint effect that these guys use. And that's a, that's a, that's a you know that's a cool uh, example of how you know these guys are just being creative and being cool with the way that they do type. You don't see the same type of excitement with the Tamil or the Urdu, though. No, in fact, uh, I have seen like Kannada. Yeah. They have done this better, and like I have done a project where like, I told you about it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did a lot of photography in uh, Karnataka just trying to find yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So these guys have done a lot of effects, like yeah. having two or three layers of uh, yeah, totally, the totally. Yeah, that's there. I'm just saying in this particular example, it's not there. Yeah. Um, this is a, um, I didn't get to read this whole thing, but um, it'll probably take me a while to read it. But this is, uh, I saw this in a shelter in Sakhalishpur, which is, I went there a couple months ago. 
Uh, and it has something to do with uh, hygiene in bathrooms or, or family planning or something like that. So if people can, if people can read, if people can want to read the whole thing through, then they can probably explain that to me better. But basically, the point is that it's hand painted. It's kind of, it's an official. Um, it's an it's an official kind of notice board type of thing, but it's totally hand painted. So effectively making it uh, informal in this case. Um, and the informality extends to very official places as well. Um, again, so this is Chennai Central Station. This is the official station sign, and it's been hand painted. Um, so that speaks to the uh, informality there as well. Generally, it is like the stopping is cancelled. Yeah. Well, sometimes, yeah. How do you differentiate between the official? How do you know it's hand painted or? Between, how, how it's like a developed, it? between like whether it's like a developed uh, typeface oh. that has been. Uh, Built by officially through you know by a typographer versus something that is just put together. I mean you'll see that you'll see the others. The next sign over will not have the same type of look to the to the letters because it's just been painted. Sorry. Different ones in each station. Different ones in each station. And of, and of, yeah, different ones within each station and of course in different stations as well. And yeah, what you said was right. It's not standardized. So I guess standardization is the, is the key thing. But I was gonna. Uh, bring uh, bring that up later, but um, this is another one in in, um, in Chennai. This is the uh, the bus, uh, the Metropolitan Bus Authority, uh, which has also been hand painted. But this, uh, if you see on any if any, any Chennai bus, will use the exact same type of stencil. So um, you know this, perhaps you could consider as uh, standardized. And depending on, I mean, for this particular context at least. Can anyone read the one here? Yeah, one of them. Yeah. That. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so Ratna Ramnathan is a designer who, is, I believe, splits her time between the UK and here. And she made an interesting point, which is that there's a great need in India for basic functional typographic design. And that was, and that that comes back to the earlier point that I made that things are tend to be flashy, not standardized, very colorful and exciting, but not quite functional and not quite applicable practically um, for things. And when I mean practical, practically applicable, I mean things like textbooks or road signs or just very simple things that. Uh, will make it easy for people to lead their lives. But I think um, with with many of the changes that are happening in India and uh, with with an increase, I guess, in um, with an increase in delivering importance for typographic design, uh, you'll see that there will be changes in um, a lot of different ways. Um, these are just four ways. Um, I think as technology changes in the country, um, for example, um, there's an entire, I mean, the entire, there's a whole generation in India which has skipped the whole landline phone uh, phase and went straight to mobile phones. So, what are they reading on the mobile phones? And a lot of these people are not, they're not able to read English or they're not able to read uh, Latin script. So, in those types of circumstances, there will be real value in delivering uh, typography um, for for a local language. Um, for, for example, for example, that's readable on a mobile phone. Um, literacy can be improved by standardizing simple typography, I think. Um, and that's something that can, we can touch on, or that can go on for hours, that's another discussion. Um, but again, to the point with the mobile phones that I made earlier, localization can happen with, uh, with typography, which means that typography, as it makes sense for each, each place, um, can be developed. For example, how Thai brought in uh, Western styles of type and adapted it directly to their local context. Um, so maybe new fonts will be developed based on the local uh, cultural needs. So if there's an IKEA that opens up, who knows? What if there's a need for a you know Devanagari style IKEA script? It's probably not the case because IKEA's clientele will probably know how to read English. <laughs> um, and standardization, which they mentioned was is super super uh, important and I think standardization is one of the things that drives um, that drives practical applicability for typography um, so as you see um, as you see development happening in India you'll see for example there's BDA boards for instance which most of them use the same type um, Bangalore Development Authority um, and you'll
you'll see the similar thing in Mumbai and Delhi as well. The Delhi road signs all have the same type in uh, English, uh, Punjabi, Devnagari, and Urdu. So that sort of standardization as it reaches beyond the metros and into the villages and into uh, different areas of the country will will create a, um, an avenue for typography to flourish uh, for Indian type. I found this interesting. This is this is this is in Singapore, and Singapore has standardized a, a Tamil type Tamil typeface. The Bengali is just uh, there because of that specific locale, uh, which is in Little India, and uh, there's a lot of Bangladeshi uh, people there in that area. But basically, um, it's interesting that Singapore has standardized the Indian typeface, and we have yet to see such a level of standardization in most places within India. Like I said, Delhi and other places have it, but um, but most places don't. Um, like I said earlier, practical applicability for oops, practical applicability for uh, type is is key for the for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Um, and and one uh, foundry, I guess, that creates type types, which I think, that I admire a lot, and it's one of the major ones here in the country, um, is in Ahmedabad, and it's the Indian Type Foundry, which has created a set of a uh, variety of different typefaces for different languages, and they've, and they've touched on, let's see, they've done Gujarati, Gurmukhi, Bengali, and Tamil, as well as uh, Latin script as well. So, this is, it looks super simple, not that exciting, but uh, this is a type of type that uh, we'll see. I think we need more of in the country too, as as India develops and as India um, as India becomes a world power. Um, oh, the other interesting thing about this is that the first um, that the, I believe is a hundred day of at the top, but it was at the Mahakumbhala this year. Um, Life Boy did a. Uh, a I don't know. Did you see that? Yeah. Huh? Okay, maybe this will go But basically, it was an Indian type boundary yeah. typeface that uh, was used by Lifebuoy to uh, stamp chapatis that were they were serving at the Mahapamela and saying that you should wash your hands before eating. So, so that's just a creative uh, way to use a very easy to read, practically applicable typeface for that particular campaign. So, basically, think of you know all the other cool stuff that you can do to to reach the masses with basic, very easy to read typography that's practical and uh, readable. So here's the world map again with, uh, with all the countries and scripts together. So just to touch on again, so you know, with one third of the world's land mass, it's 50% of the world's typography is non-Western, or 50% of the world's, um, or 80, oh, I forgot the numbers, but. <laughs> Basically, a what third of the world's landmass holds uh, the vast majority of typefaces, 85% of the typefaces in the world. So, as these countries develop, especially ours here in India, um, the development of new typefaces is crucial, I think, and is something that we can all look forward to, um, and and is something that's 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 going to be a signifier, I think, for uh, for the development of India going forward. So. Um, basically, that's that's basically about it for what I have to say today. So What's the uh, other color on the, at the top of North America? That's, uh, that's, sorry? No, no, but, no, no, but. no, no, uh, that's, that was, that's it, that's the Nunavut region of, uh, of Canada, where it's, they use, they don't use Western typeface, but it's a very, it's a very small minor language, it's only used by a few thousand people, so, hence, I didn't I didn't include small languages in this presentation, or small, uh, you know, types, typefaces, or type or scripts that are used by a small, very small number of people. So, yeah. Any questions? Okay. One more question. Anybody? Thanks, Vivek. Okay.